So, they're all distinguished panelists and listeners online and in the room. Welcome to the session Nordic Green Shipping, hosted by Nordic Energy Research here at the Nordic Pavilion at COP28. My name is Kevin Johnson. I'm the COO at Nordic Energy Research, and I will be your moderator today. Nordic Energy Research is an institution for joint energy research and policy cooperation under the Nordic Council of Ministers. The aims of our work include increasing cooperation in sustainable forms of energy, stimulating the development of new and competitive energy solutions, um, and supporting the Nordic uh, region's green transition to carbon neutrality. On your chairs, you can find a postcard with information about how you can connect with us and stay updated on our work. So, the fourth IMO greenhouse gas study uh, estimated a 56% increase in greenhouse gas emissions from international shipping between 2012 and 2020. And consequently, international shipping contribu contributed to about 3% of the global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in 2018. We at Nordic Energy Research public, published a Navigating Towards Cleaner Maritime Shipping uh, publication together with ITF, the International Transport Forum, in 2020, a report where we looked into how the future energy use in the shipping sector of the Nordic region could develop. Following that, we in 2021 initiated a Nordic Maritime Transport and Energy Research Program, a research program where we aim to map, develop, and use uh, alternative energy sources in maritime operation, operations and support the decarbonization of the Nordic maritime sector together with the Nordic research financiers, fund, ending up funding three successful projects that ended this year. The day before yesterday, we opened a second round of funding through the Nordic Maritime Transport and Energy Research Program, uh, funding projects focused on and or including the supply chain and bunkering, ship design, energy efficiency, and safety measures and standards. And for the first time in Nordic Energy Research history, the Faroe Islands are also a part of the funding partners as well. So, we will do a slight change of the program. So first up will be Tristan Smith, uh, let's welcome you to the stage. Tristan, you lead a research group of five research associates and eight PhD students uh, focused on studying the global shipping industry at the UCL Energy Institute. You have a background in engineering uh, and naval architecture, and you have worked on ships and submarines before returning to the university. Um, you, you, you stated that a few years ago you wanted to apply your knowledge towards emission reductions in the shipping industry, and today you will give us a brief introduction to the IMO regulations and IMO's revised strategy. So, welcome. Thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm losing my voice, but I hope you can hear okay. Uh, I'll try and speak clearly into the microphone. So, um, as Kevin very kindly introduced, I'm a researcher, I'm an academic, but I spend a lot of time at the IMO, we advise a lot of countries, and I attend as a delegate of the Institute of Marine Engineers. A lot of our studies go in to inform the policies that they're making on greenhouse gas emissions. And in July this year, <coughs> they adopted the revised strategy on greenhouse gas reductions that we were closely involved in. And I guess it's in interpreting that that I wonder if I can contribute a bit to your event today. So. I want to draw attention to three parts of that revised strategy. The first is the ambition statements. There is some language about reaching net zero around 2050. That bit is the least interesting from my perspective. The most important is the interim targets for 2030 and 2040. They des describe in a sector international shipping that has previously not been held very much to account an absolute reduction of 20 to 30 percent reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in 2030, and an absolute reduction of 70 to 80 percent greenhouse gas emissions in 2040. But because trade is growing, those absolute reductions are much more stringent for what the average ship needs to do. The average ship will need to do about a 60 percent greenhouse gas intensity reduction in 2030 on a 2008 baseline, and a 90 percent, 90 percent greenhouse gas intensity reduction on a 20, 2008 baseline in 2040. It's now 23, so in 17 years, the average fleet, the average ship in the global fleet has to be 90% more or lower greenhouse gas intensity. You cannot do that just on energy efficiency, biofuel, blue fuels, 
carbon capture and storage. Those options are all off the table in 17 years' time, possibly sooner. So the only solutions that we are now leaving space for in the near future, in the time horizon of investments that are being made today, are hydrogen-derived, green hydrogen-derived solutions. So the, the ambition, the signal sent by that IMO revised strategy is incredibly strong to the technology pathway that the sector now has to adopt. So that's one element. The other element of it is that that, that language in the IMO's strategy is unambiguously about well-to-wake greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not just what comes out of the exhaust of the ship, it's what happens on land. And that's really important because that drives an investment case on land, not just on the technologies that are used on board. And then the third element, which is often overlooked, is to do with th the obligation in the language to enable and contribute to a just and equitable transition. So there are many countries in the IMO process who are very concerned about how higher transport costs would have a negative impact on their economic development, on their growth. And the IMO's responsibility to, to acknowledge that, but also acknowledge the needs of countries that are existentially threatened by temperatures rising above 1.5 degrees, of which there are 55 odd countries within the Climate Vulnerable Forum, for example. Those countries are looking at all sectors that have pollution responsibilities and asking what they're going to do from a finance perspective. So those two elements create an interesting landscape for what the IMO does in 2025 when it converts that ambition statement into globally binding legislation that will drive business case. And one of them is obviously to drive the business case for some very rapid change in technology. But the other is to create opportunities for relationships especially with lower income countries to make sure that the technology transition is inclusive of those countries and to make sure that, that the way that this happens isn't just limited to the higher income countries like my country, the UK, like the Nordic region where so much of the technology development is already happening. And it was very interesting to hear a panel, I don't know if anyone else was listening to the Lloyd's Register and Sustainable Shipping Initiative discussion on Africa's role, but the African delegates were very clear that their requirements with the finance, technology, and standards, and that they wanted to be as involved in the high-value opportunities of this transition as uh, everyone else. And that, that's a different landscape to the one we have at the moment, where finance of shipping, technology development is a, is a very European-centric and a Scandinavian-centric area, and a lot of the manufacturing, the construction is in Asia. So we have a... We have two continents that are notably missing from the opportunities at the moment, that, that, which cannot continue. Um, so that's one of the descript descriptions of what has happened at the IMO. I'd like to break this down into, into a couple of periods in terms of what this might mean next for the, for the business community and where the opportunities that the commercial landscape can take are. So one of those periods is from now until 2027. 23 to 27, before any IMO policy enters into force. And that's a very difficult period because you're reliant on initiatives like the funding that you just announced, national governments to try and help. But we know that the scale of the finance assistance or the business case needed to develop long-run solutions, the hydrogen solutions I talked about, will be needed very, very soon. The, the business case for that is very difficult to do without an IMO policy or strong national policy. The only levers that we can point to are those that come from uh, the customers of shipping. So initiatives like Zemba, which aggregate demand from first mover buyers of services of zero emissions shipping, for example. We then have the period 27 to 35, which is the early point when IMO regulation enters into force. And that's very difficult to anticipate now because there is no specific language that can enable business case. And then we have the period from 35 onwards where it's primarily driven by compliance with whatever the regime we have at the IMO. And I'd be really interested when we have a chance to discuss in, in comments after this how the, how the corporates see those three periods and what they will need in each of those three periods in order to maximize the speed that we can move this transition. So that's, that's what I wanted to do to set up the discussion and I look forward to, to coming back at the end and, and seeing how it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. So next up is a distinguished panelist. Uh, um, 
Her Excellency Miss Ingeline Ström. She was yes. She is the Minister of the Environment uh, at the Faroe Islands, um, and in the 2019 parliamentary election, you were elected to the Paris Par Parliament for the first time. Uh, if I'm correct, you're also the woman that received the most uh, personal votes in the election. Uh, and you have studied uh, the Paris language and literature. So you're here today to give a brief introduction to some of the unique challenges that the Faroe Islands has in the green uh, transition. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the privilege of addressing you today as we delve into the important topic of green transition within maritime shipping and transport. In my capacity as the Minister of Energy, Environment and Climate in the Faroe Islands, I am deeply committed to steering our nation toward a sustainable and green future. Our target to reduce CO2 emissions by 45% compared to 20. 2010 levels reflects the urgency of addressing our carbon footprint, especially considering that our current per capita emissions exceeding 20 tons per year. While uh, this goal is uh, ambitious for us, it's also a necessary one and it propels us to be at the forefront of environmental stewardship. The Faroe Islands, despite being small, boasts substantial renewable energy resources. On land, we have made commendable progress with half of our oil consumption already addressed. The ongoing electrification of heating, transportation and industry, coupled with our commitment to 100% green electricity production, is a testament to our determination. The systematic installation of wind turbines and the embrace of electric cars have heralded a transformative area marking 2021 as the year of peak oil. However, the maritime sector is responsible for half of our emissions, which poses a unique challenge. To meet our 2030 target, we must initiate the reduction in maritime oil consumption without delay. Stakeholders across our maritime activities, fishermen, salmon farmers, and cargo and passenger, sh passenger ship operation operators are already aligning their strategies with green principles. Yet the transformation required at sea demands a global effort. International cooperation is imperative. In collaboration with our Nordic neighbors, we have seen successes, such as, for example, the first electric service vessel for, for salmon farming, which is a testament to the viability of green solutions. I am sure that once the industry sees the viability of such solution, change will happen. While battery electrification proves effective for activities close to the shore, like ferries, aquaculture vessels, and tourism, it falls short when vessels navigate the open sea. I therefore commend the Nordic Corporation for focusing ongoing research on uncovering innovative, innovative approaches to green challenges in the maritime sector. While the promise of power to X has seemed quite distant for some time, it is now becoming increasingly prevalent. And together with our Nordic friends, we are actively engaged in finding solutions. As we witness advancements in wind turbines, solar cells, and tidal energy, the prospect of producing hydrogen for fuel becomes feasible. This opens avenues to produce green fuels like ammonia, laying the groundwork for a sustainable maritime industry. Acknowledging the enormity of the energy required for such a transformation. We contemplate solutions like expansive offshore wind farms with floating turbines, a visionary step toward a green future. Collaboration among the Nordic countries in this endeavor is of great importance. The benefits of shared knowledge, resources, and technolo technological innovations are evident, propelling us towards a sustainable and resilient future. Together, we can forge ahead in achieving our climate goals, demonstrating that international cooperation is not just an option, but a necessity in navigating the complex water, 
waters of a greener maritime future. Thank you. So we will move on to our panel discussion. So we have one panelist stuck in traffic. So if uh, you, Marianne, and you, uh, Janne, could take the chairs, and then we'll see if Sundis will be able to join us as well. <clears throat> so first out uh, will be uh, Janne Junger. You are the communications and public relations uh, responsible at Vatsla in Norway, uh, a company that develops a green propulsion system to the shipping industry, both when it comes to electrification, to a diversity of vessels, and the development of combustion technology to meet the future demand of green fuels. Vatsla is a Finnish company with a strong Nordic presence in Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, and the company have made strong commitments to develop green technology to meet the maritime and energy sector's need for new sustainable solutions. Yuyana has a broad experience in different fields as a journalist, historian, writer, and director of cultural institutions, but now you're a part of the shipping industry. And in your current role, you have been part of several groundbreaking uh, EU and innovation projects. So, take the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I hope this will... Yes. Uh, I will... Uh, I have a double role today because I'm talking uh, from my position in Vatsla, but also I'm talking from uh, my role as a communication manager for the SEEDS initiative. And uh, this, uh, we also have to thank the Nordic uh, Council of Ministers because the SEEDS initiative was founded by Nordic Innovation in the start. So thank you for that. What I want to share with you is a journey we made uh, that brought us so many unexpected <laughs> ways. We ended up in um, Berlevogen in the Arctic, but a little introduction to seeds. Uh, we were uh, in Wärtsla, we were uh, asking ourselves the questions, yes, we uh, at Stord, where I'm uh, situated, we do uh, electrification of vessels, passenger vessels, ferries, uh, all kind of offshore supply vessels, and uh, we've done that uh, for the past 10 years. And now we said, okay, what's the next step? Uh, we have to start investing in future fuels. What is the fuel? And how can we actually find it out? Should we go back to our laboratories at Wärtsla and see what we could do? Or should we actually go out there, talk to the energy producers, the ship owners, and see what are other people's um, thinking and learn. So we put up this uh, initiative in 2019 with big Nordic companies at Arca Solution were there, Equinor. We had uh, the Danish ship owner, the FTS, the Norwegian ship owner, Grieg, and Wärtsla. And we even have IKEA with us uh, as the transporter, but they are so big that they cannot their logo will not be shown <laughs> in their work, but they were there and they said, okay, just do this. Just, just um, uh, we want to cut our emission from the transportation with 70% before 2030. So deliver on that, that's your task. So uh, what we first uh, looked at in seeds was producing clean energy in the North Sea, green ammonia that we could store and produce and store and deliver out there. But what actually happened is that I said it took us so many strange places and we ended up in Berlevogen in the north of Norway, which Marianne also will tell you more about. But the task here was given by the Minister of Climate in Norway. And they said, we are looking at uh, Longabien at Svalbard because we're powering on cold up there. Uh, it's the place in the Nordics or in Europe with the biggest uh, emission footprints. So how could we go uh, from coal to zero? And uh, they, had a, um, they had a solution on LNG on their table, but they said, bring us forward. So uh, we said, okay, how can we build a green corridor and make um, green ammonia from wind on Ragovida in Berlevog to be delivered to Longabi and Svalbard, but also for other use uh, 
to, sh to fuel ships along the Norwegian coast, and also the, the big hustle, the big Nordic problem, <laughs> Norwegian problem is to electrify the Norton Shell. So how can we actually build uh, these um, regional green corridors? So together with um, Norwegian partners, we build this coalition uh, that, uh, because the, in Berlevog they had power, but they didn't have any grid. So uh, how can you trans how can you utilize all those remote places with power with no grid and ammonia we saw as the answer and uh, so this is a kind of a regional uh, ecosystem where you have a ammonia factory you have the ship MS Green Ammonia that also is powering on MS Green Ammonia that comes and and um, uh, it's, uh, transport the ammonia up to Longyearbyen. And what we actually in Wärtsela had to do is that yes, these companies that we work with here, I will show you the logos later, are so competent in their technology. What is it Wärtsela has to deliver? We have to deliver the combustion technology to burn the uh, green ammonia. So that's what we have been working uh, on the last four years. And actually two weeks ago, we launched the first commercial um, ammonia engine, the Wetzel 25. And we have a customer for it, uh, Veridis. Uh, they come from Amon Mar uh, Marine uh, that will tr also have built another ecosystem with uh, in the Norwegian coast. So that's uh, very, very exciting. And when putting together the different technologies of these companies and using it in new ways, we saw that we could actually build this ecosystem. And you can use the, you can build different ecosystem along the coast and other corridors, but uh, I have to, I have to uh, also, yeah, <laughs> have to also see that what we learned that is that there are so many um, discussions you need to take with the local community, but I can come back to that. That's one of the taking the bottom up uh, perspective instead of big companies coming into the community and say, hey, we're going to put this up, but you know, be there, have that conversation with them. So the the travel of Wärtsla, the journey we are on, is to take our, the core of our technology as the combustion engine. And we've been on the journey here to, to uh, develop the technology for uh, burning uh, hydrogen and ammonia. And the usage what I see is to also uh, marine. We were very uh, into the marine sector, but now we see there has so many uh, other usages like uh, power plants and off-grid societies and the offshore installation. I will be quick now because uh, I think I'm running out of time. But here is the MS Green Ammonia together with Greg that also will deliver the ammonia to other uh, users. So this is the um, consortium that has put on the Balavog project. And here you see AquaClean Hydrogen and that they have taken this further. So um, yeah, that's uh, all for me now. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Anna. So our next speaker will be Marianne uh, Stigset, Director of Communication and External Affairs at Aqua Horizon. Uh, a developer of green energy and green industry. Uh, you have worked in the energy space in various roles for the last uh, 15 years, spanning from oil and gas to clean hydrogen, renewable energy, and carbon capture and storage solutions. Prior to joining Aqua Solutions, you have worked as a partner at corporate communications, assisting green energy technology companies with uh, mergers and acquisitions, IPOs, and industrial relations. And you started your career at the World Bank in Washington and has since held senior management positions at Bloomberg News, Extractive Industries, Transparency Initiative, and the EAT Foundation. So, welcome. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah, it is. Okay. 
so yes, uh, I uh, come from uh, Arca Horizons, which is part of the Arca Group. Um, and for those of you who don't know it, it's Arca is, is one of the biggest uh, privately owned industrial companies in Norway. Uh, we have quite a long industrial heritage, 180 years. For 180 years, we've been great breaking new grounds uh, in the energy uh, space, and we continue to do so today, uh, now in uh, renewable energy, carbon capture and storage, and uh, hydrogen. Uh, and this is done through Arca Horizons, which is the energy transition vehicle of, of the Arca Group. Our uh, hydrogen portfolio, uh, which comes from Arca Clean Hydrogen, is, uh, encompasses several projects, but uh, we have four projects under development in Norway today, both blue and green, um, through which we aim to contribute to the decarbonization of, of hard-to-abate uh, sectors such as cement and steel and transportation, and, and, and most notably the maritime, uh, maritime transportation. And I'd like to zoom in on, on, on two projects in particular that we're working on uh, that are of relevance to today's discussion. The first one is um, our uh, flagship project, Narvik Green Ammonia, which we're developing up in the north of Norway together with our partner, Stadkraft. And uh, this is a, uh, we're planning to build a 600 megawatt uh, green ammonia plant um, with a production of 400,000 tons, uh, metric tons uh, per annum already from 2028. And so that would be one of Europe's first large scale green ammonia uh, plants. Um, the plant is located in the Norwegian power area of NO4, which might not mean a lot to, to some of you, but it's, it's an area with an abundance of hydropower. Um, we have central elements in place for the, for the project. We have uh, a 10-year PPA agreement with Startcraft. Uh, we were recently um, allocated uh, 250 megawatts of uh, grid capacity by Startnet, uh, which secures us ample production capacity for the green ammonia. And so now um, the current status of the project is that we're working together with Startcraft uh, to um, reach a, a concept select and, and a DG2 uh, over the course of next year. And then the next step is uh, aiming to reach a final investment decision in 2025 and start commercial operations in 2028. Um, to date, the project has signed letters of intent with um, several major European energy, industrial and uh, chemical companies. Uh, for over three times our planned production volume. And that's a key piece of the puzzle to get in place. And so now we're maturing, uh, trying to mature these LOIs over to, to uh, firm long-term offtake agreements. And then we'll also be looking for opportunities for offtakers, uh, uh, for collaboration with possible offtakers in, in, in Norway and, and, uh, and, and here, especially the maritime industry. And then our second project, which is the one that Jane has already alluded, Jan has already alluded to, is uh, <clears throat> the one in Balevog, up in the in the uh, in the Arctic. And so here, uh, together with uh, Varange Kraft, Norwegian utility company, uh, we're working on developing a green ammonia uh, production facility to uh, provide shipping industry and, and off-grid communities in the Arctic with clean energy. So the plan is to build a 200 plus megawatt uh, green ammonia uh, facility in the first phase, uh, using, as, as Jan alluded to, the um, renewable power from Varange Kraft's adjacent uh, wind park uh, at uh, Ragovida. Uh, we already have a 2.5 megawatt um, uh, pilot hydrogen um, plant in place uh, that's already in operation being powered from, from the wind farm. And uh, just recently, just last month, we were awarded uh, a grid connection from, from Startnet, which, which is important, like Jan alluded to. It's a uh, scarce resource uh, grid connection up there. So, uh, so that, was, uh, that was an important element to get in place, 125 megawatt. And, uh, and so now the team is assessing how we can, how we can design a robust um, a project with this, with this foundation. And as has been previously mentioned, we're collaborating with Grig and uh, Varsila on develop, uh, who are developing this, this uh, green ammonia-fueled um, uh, tanker vessel that will ensure the transportation of uh, ammonia from the production facilities in, in, in Balevog and uh, to markets along the coast of, uh, of Norway as well as northern Europe. And, and lastly, I just, uh, I'd just like to, to, to really emphasize that for us, it's important to be an early mover. We really want to uh, move fast in order to meet uh, the shipping industry's decarbonization efforts. 
uh, and to take part in international efforts in bringing down the cost curve uh, and make hydrogen and, and its derivatives, such as, such as uh, green ammonia, um, an attractive alternative to uh, enable emissions reductions. I'll, I'll keep it at that for now. Thank you. So I, I would like to begin with a kind of narrowing down to the Nordic region and to the, and, and to the national countries. So what is the national and Nordic policy measures that you think would be most urgent to, to accelerate the adoption to support the deployment of green shipping technologies? Would you like to, do you have any points, Janne? You're asking me? Yeah. yeah. Is this on? So the question is what kind of national or Nordic, Nordic policy. Uh, policy we need? Uh, I think we need, a, you know, the polluter must uh, be punished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we need to be, to be more strict on taxes. Uh, CO2 taxes and also in the Nordics and especially in Norway we have a discussion on the contracts of difference mm -hmm. so can we actually um, yeah uh, reward uh, and give uh, support to the vessel owners that want to take the green fuel uh, into their operation because what we have seen in Norway we have worked so long with uh, electrification and uh, Offshore companies like Adisweek that has been front runners, and they have not been awarded. They can be uh, awarded to put the technology into use, but when it comes to the operations, uh, they will not have any um, kind of uh, awards <laughs> from the government. So, I think that will be very important, and also, of course, uh, work on. Uh, regulations that are not only for the Nordics and uh, but are more common and I really really believe that we should support the ecosystem building the building of the green corridors the building of the putting up the first um, uh, infrastructure uh, supply chains because today you can have funding to pilot uh, new technology in a vessel uh, or a research uh, project, but we should pi we should fund the whole building of the infrastructure. So carbon taxes, uh, contracts for difference, and building ecosystems. Do you have anything to add to that, Mayana? Uh, well, I think that this is a nascent industry, so so we need to we need to do whatever it takes to create demand. And and, and even if in our case, even if we have very favorable conditions. Mm -hmm. Uh, up in the north of Norway to produce uh, green hydrogen, uh, given that we have access to hydropower and, and access to wind power, it's still too expensive at this stage for off-takers to, to, to choose our green product rather than um, uh, the uh, grey hydrogen from, from natural gas. So uh, we, need, we need policies like Anna alluded to to, to, to bridge that gap. Um, it's, it's been very positive what's been happening, what's been coming out of the European Union uh, in the last uh, few years with, with um, you know, Repower EU and, and the Net Zero Industry Act uh, and, and now uh, the uh, European Hydrogen Bank uh, auction round uh, for, for 3 billion euros. So these are all very positive measures and we also see specific countries uh, such as Germany who have done a, a tremendous effort in, in mobilizing uh, support and incentives uh, that will um, increase sort of the, the, the willingness for, for industry to take, to, to take that first step. Um, it's, it's a bit up for debate now in Germany. Well, we hope it goes the right way. Uh, so this, this mix of carrot and stick approach, I think, really works um, from, from the stick angle, uh, if you can call it that, uh, what we've seen uh, with the adoption of the renewable energy Directive uh, 3 uh, earlier this year, uh, which requires users of hydrogen uh, to, um, to use 42% uh, of, of hydrogen by 2030. That's an example of, of regulation that really stimulates demand and, and uh, enables early movers to, to actually move and, and that can get this market up and running. So Tristan kind of gave you a challenge earlier. Uh, how, how can the, the Nordic countries uh, and or the European countries also work with the, the developing nations uh, in Africa and other places. So how can US, do US companies uh, work closely with the developing markets and, and what, is, what would you say is your role in also making sure that Africa and other, other regions in the world uh, can take part in this transition that is beginning to happen in, in the Nordics? 
Should I start? Yeah. I think what we are doing in Battle of Wagen, building that value chain, e easily can, we can flip the, ma the map mm -hmm. and we can do the same other places in the world because if you build regional uh, ecosystem like that, uh, you can also utilize the energy you have at the place. And uh, so I think that um, we can contrib contribute uh, in the Nordics with also uh, what we have um, as a main asset and that is trust because to do this to build these chains you have to have the trust in uh, between the companies like we have had and for Versla it's a quite a new position to be uh, talking with the ship owners the pr energy producers openly freely about what we actually are doing testing used to be very like uh, we're testing this and then we will launch it and but now it's more like hey we 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 are preparing this technology because we s and we want to hear is is this the right thing to do and how can we do this together so maybe we can uh, we have a, um, a thing we can export that we don't think about but the knowledge of putting up uh, collaborations and consortium and of course uh, share uh, our technology and uh, solutions that we we are f finding at the moment. Yeah. And at Ocker's Horizons, are you also working uh, yeah. outside of the Nordics as well? Uh, we are working outside of the Nordics. Uh, so w we we have a we have a global presence. Uh, we have renewable energy products uh, projects um, all over the world, from from Latin America to to South Africa to. Uh, uh, to Southeast Asia, so um, we and and through those projects, the renewable energy projects, uh, you know, we're also looking to for, to explore our power tax opportunities and, and opportunities for hydrogen projects. Um, but I think I think what Janus it really resonated with me. I think this this building of um, uh, collaboration models uh, that we could export elsewhere because we see. Again, that this is this is a is this an immature market, and in order to get it up and running, we really need to bring uh, cross-sectoral collaboration, and in, in the same way as we're doing uh, up at uh, at, at Balivog with, with bringing together uh, the, the 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 power producer with the ammonia producer with the actual shipping companies that will both design the vessels that are going to bring this around and and uh, and, and transport it. So I think finding those ways of of cross-sectoral collaboration that could be exported elsewhere is going to be key and uh, and then also bringing down the costs I mean that's essential if we're going to have a just and equitable energy transition that we need to bring down costs and the opportunity the the responsibility resides with us mm -hmm. to bring it down because we have the opportunity to do this so I think through the technology developments that we're doing in the Nordics through uh, policy measures such as what we're seeing in the US with the IRA uh, that is going to, to bring down uh, the, the the levelized costs of, of production here and, and have a, a, a trigger effect across supply chains that will also benefit uh, other regions uh, in uh, notably in the global south so I think that's two areas where we can we can really contribute so you Jan, I mentioned that uh, you're working also with the local community in the project uh, it's been an ongoing theme here at the Nordic pavilion to, to secure that there is a, a just transition and that you also need to include include the whole society so how do you as companies work to to make sure that your projects are being accepted, uh, that they are, uh, that you listen to local resistance and so forth. Uh, how do you as companies work uh, to mitigate that? Yeah, the seeds journey has actually uh, brought us, uh, <laughs> brought us to the local pub in Balvog, and the pub in Longabien, and we've been in the um, municipality meeting in Balvog, and, and that is places that uh, Wärtsela never used to go. <laughs> we, were, is, we have been in the shipping sphere and the shipping uh, meetings at uh, North Shipping and all those kind of places, but to actually be part of the value chain um, work <laughs> is uh, then you have to work in a quite different way because we learned this when we started to do electrification of the ferries in the Norwegian fjords because you can we can deliver the technology yes we can uh, we can uh, upgrade to a hybrid or a battery solution or something but 
what about the, this, the fjords of Norway? They are going to charge there, and there's no power on shore. So we had to start talking with the local uh, uh, power companies. We had to start building this change already then, and then when we moved to, f to future fuels, we saw that uh, this knowledge we have to take further, actually, because we need to, um, to talk with the local energy companies, the other partners that come in, and also to secure that the vulnerable nature, the bird life, and if you talk about Ragovida, you also have a Sami population with uh, the reindeers that we need to, um, to be sure that all these are working together. So we, you have to be in at what we call in the Nordic, the Folkemöt, <laughs> or the public meetings, mm -hmm. to just listen and also to secure that you know what's happening in their mind and they know what you're thinking about. And uh, in Sauda, they are putting up a green ammonia uh, production plant. There's a little industrial community in Norway and they have this green cafe. Every month they invite the whole population there for a green cafe. They can come and have cafe and then discuss and what's actually happening. What is green ammonia? How is it dangerous? Is it toxic? And what actually is this all about? Because they are used to making uh, aluminium. Uh, but now they're uh, going to make uh, green ammonia in their little uh, community. So I believe in the, this approach. So I imagine that you at Acker Horizons also work closely with the local communities where you work as well, Mayanne? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's an important part of, uh, of, the, of the, the, the project work that we do. Um, in order to, to be able to uh, get going on, on some of these green industrial projects that we have uh, planned up north, uh, it's absolutely essential that we work closely with, with local communities. I mean, we need... We need, a, even though we have an abundance of hydropower, uh, it's going to be a scarcity within the next couple of years. We need more uh, renewable energy up and running, and the fastest and, and, and cheapest way to do that is, is wind on land, um, which does, isn't always uh, equally popular. So, so spending a lot of time with local communities, explaining the benefits and understanding what are the different interests so we can cohabitate in the best possible way, and it should be through um, uh, reindeer um, uh, activities, the reindeer um, drift and, and, uh, and other activities, uh, getting the local acceptance from local politicians, um, having regular um, uh, meetings, uh, open town halls to, to explain and, and to take questions on any kind of questions they may have on, on security issues related to hydrogen production and ammonia is, uh, is really important. And also to, to do our share to, to ensure that, that, that the, also the economic and fi well, financial benefits uh, come, to, come to the local community, be it through green jobs uh, as, well as, as well as taxes. So this is uh, an important component. So thank you to the panel. Give them an applause. So lastly, I'm going to invite uh, Tristan up again to give some comment here in the end. So Tristan, you gave them a kind of a challenge, and they, you can use, uh, or you can sit there. And you, that is okay. And you used, you tried to, do you feel that they responded? It feels a bit like an exam, doesn't it? <laughs> like, I gave you a challenge, and then, I know I'm an academic. Yeah, good job, well done. Um, sorry, it's on. Yeah, it's this one. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's really difficult, isn't it? And it's really brilliant to hear what, what has been going on. And I was aware of your projects, but it was very useful to get the specifics. Um, uh, I, yeah, I think, I think we, there's a bit that I would be really interested to see if you think it's possible to go beyond what you said. So uh, exporting the mechanisms of collaboration and the uh, structures that you've had to build in order to get those projects to go. I think that collaboration is quite culturally sensitive. So there's a way that you do it in, in the Nordic countries, which maybe isn't the same as the way that people in Africa or Latin America will, will end up forming the equivalent or are forming the equivalent structures. Um, so I, I would guess that we need to look at the extent to which that's a direct export and the extent to which there's going to need to be a different model. But I wonder also if there's an opportunity for even more uh, cross-fertilization or interoperation between companies that are in the Nordics. I mean, I know you're multinational and you're doing projects in all these other countries, but 
the level of uh, trust that you needed in order to do your exercises, I think requires an openness in the international business community which isn't quite there yet. You know, we're seeing these initiatives happen in communities where uh, everyone is already in a working relationship because they're neighbors and they understand the way that they do business with each other. But we need to, the speed that we now need to move requires us to break down something much more fundamental than that. And just to put an illustration on the speed that we need to move, um, the scale is it 600 megawatts. How, how many million tons of ammonia? 400,000. About, for, about half a million. So, so about half a million thousand, sorry, half a million tons of production of ammonia, the shipping industry alone, without the other off-takers, officially needs 30, striving for 60 million tons in 2030, scaling to 400 million tons in 2040. So we would not do this at, at that rate, <laughs> as you know. We need to suddenly uh, explode is the wrong word, but, but ramp up so quickly from those first FIDs that you get in the 25, in 2025, as you get your first FID by 26, by 27, those need to be going on an exponential curve, and the amount of collaboration and uh, renewable energy and everything that that's going to need is, is just going to need this a, a new level of international working, I think, beyond, beyond what we were just hearing. And I, th and I think that the, the reward will be there as well. So we've talked, can I go back to another comment that was made? You talked about the OPEX challenge, the fact that you know, there is some evidence of the hydrogen bank and there'll be capital grants. But the, for the shipping industry to become an off-taker, it needs someone to underwrite the OPEX. Otherwise, the only ammonia that you produce will go into the chemicals industry and the others that have a national or a European uh, regulatory framework. EU's Fit for 55 policy, sadly, does not make a business case for shipping to use a hydrogen-derived fuel in any volume until after 2040. So the EU regulatory framework does not drive this. You need the IMO, and the IMO is going to do it with equity at its core. So the chances of there being better subsidy for OPEX in developing countries than in the Nordic region is quite high for the shipping industry. And so finding the way in which I don't, I don't want to make this into a mercenary, you know, go and set up a branch of your company in Africa because you'll get all the, all the grants, but, but there is going to be an element of this where the, the European community, the Norwegian region, cannot subsidize the scale of OPEX that we need in order to make the shipping business case, and therefore we need that IMO framework, and you need to look at how that IMO framework will actually be driving the subsidy regime, because that, that, that will be probably not in Norway. So <laughs> thank you, Nordic Kristen. regions. So, thank you so much. I think we need to wrap up. So, thank you to Inge Lindstrom, Tristan Smith, uh, Marianne Stigset, Jan Junger, but also to the listeners in the room and online. Uh, for us at Nordic Energy Research, this was our last event here at COP, but we thank you all for participating, and we hope you will be back here in the Nordic Pavilion to see all the other events that are being held here. So, thank you, uh, and 